recording. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us here for the, the volunteer wrap up online party for the 2020 Elegant Trogan surveys of five Sky Islands in Southeast Arizona. It was a huge success this year. Uh, we had a lot of participation. It was more difficult, I think, than normal to coordinate, organize, and get everyone um, everything they needed to do these surveys since pretty much all communication had to be remote and online, um, which in some ways was good because it got, I think, everything put online for everybody to access things they needed uh, to do the survey rather than some of our old, some of our strategies of meeting in person and handing out bits of paper, which we'll, I'm sure we'll go back to in the future to an extent, but having everything online for those who can't meet beforehand and all that. I think that's good that we got everything all sorted out in that way so we can proceed with that, certainly with that option in the future. But um, I was very overwhelmed in a very positive way with how great a response I got from volunteers to help with this survey. I had more help than I usually do with the Trogan surveys and it's always a well attended survey. The Trogan survey is well popular. There's a lot of people who have a lot of investment in it who've done it for many years so that's great it's always a well attended survey but i had more coverage than normal which means that for some of these mountain ranges i had pretty much complete coverage certainly of the routes we always do but had enough people to do some exploratory routes to do some routes we've always thought about doing or ones where sort of recent ebird sightings made it clear that we should go check some of these areas so i had a lot of good coverage and uh, I do want to go over the data with you guys, and it's still a little bit at the draft stage right now, but I will have finalized data for everyone by the end of the weekend. There's a little bit I need to get with uh, Rick Taylor, who also helps coordinate this count. I need to get with him and make sure we're not, get his opinion on some of the trogans. I'm, I'm thinking maybe multiple teams may have seen the same birds, some things like that. So, and I'm also still missing a tiny amount of data that we're going we're gonna to get wrapped up by the end of the weekend. Um, I think I have it. It's just, it's, I'm missing it from the results. So we will have final results for you guys um, early next week, but I do want to go over sort of the draft results with you guys. And firstly, I also wanted to say thank you so much for everyone who helped. We had over 70 people participate in these surveys, many of which participated in more than one survey. So that's 70 individual people to cover, you know, over a hundred routes. So it was very, labor intensive in terms of there's just no way we could have, you, you could do a study like this without that many people. So I really appreciate everyone's help, you know, lending their, their time, their effort and their expertise in, in chasing these trogans down and making it possible to do a large scale study like this. And this data is useful. I mean, this is the only coordinated elegant trogan survey, uh, breeding survey that happens anywhere in the United States. I mean, it is, true that Arizona is pretty much the only breeding territory, the only state that has, you know, regular breeding elegant trogans in it, but that still makes it the only survey. And Arizona Game and Fish has a lot of buy-in on this survey as well. They're very invested and they do help. You know, we have a few uh, Game and Fish people who actively help do actual part of the survey, but Troy Corman and I have been looking at the data from the last few years very, very closely and analyzing it carefully and some of the changes that we made for this year, such as asking people to document, or at least their best guess at how many miles they walked and things like that were recommendations from Troy to try to make this data as useful as possible going into the future for actual population trend tracking of these birds, mountain range by mountain range. So everyone really stepped up and did such a great job helping to map out where these trogans are, and you know record all this extra information and it really i was so impressed everyone did a great job and it really helped make this data such a useful data set it's going to be even more useful into the future so another interesting element i think of the elegant trogan surveys is that this is very much a flagship survey of the arizona important bird areas program so if you're not really that familiar with IBA, important bird areas, I'm just gonna say IBA from now on, but the IBA program, uh, that is sort of my main role at Tucson Audubon is to be a coordinator for this statewide program. But the IBA program is actually much larger than Arizona. It's, an, it's a global program. It's an international program that is headed up by Bird Conservation International out of the United Kingdom. 
with over 170 countries that participate in the program. And so the United States program, one of, one of 178 other programs happening all over the world, um, all of these national programs are identifying important bird areas all around the world and creating this worldwide network of sites that are identified as being vital for bird conservation and to sustain bird populations. So the US program is headed up by National Audubon and then it's broken down from there to state level programs and the Arizona IBA program <laughs> is headed up by myself at Tucson Audubon and uh, Ty Sipley at Audubon Arizona up in Phoenix. So for since 2004, this program has been going in Arizona and oh trogans are a great bird for us to focus on to be one of our focus species since it is listed as a species of greatest content need for Arizona IBA or excuse me for Arizona game and fish I mean as well as an IBA priority species it's also um, a species that for Arizona for the United States Arizona is the only breeding population so it's very much a responsibility bird for us and that's often how we look at some of these species as being Birds are really important for us to track since we're the only ones who, who can, you know, we have that responsibility. So all five of the mountain ranges that we survey for elegant trogans are each separate important bird areas. So the Atascosa Mountains is, or the Atascosa Highlands, which includes the Tumacocris and the Pajaritos as well, with the Atascosas as one unit, is an IBA, one of our, our newer expanded IBAs to include all those, those uh, multiple mountain ranges. Santa Rita's are a separate IBA, the Patagonia's mountains, the Huachuca Mountains and the Chiricahua Mountains are each a separate IBA. And this is one of the biggest sort of coordinated efforts we do all year for um, the Arizona uh, Important Bird Areas Program. So it's, it's a huge effort and it has huge impacts in terms of sort of getting the idea of IBA, Arizona IBA out there, as well as sort of part of our partnership with Arizona Game and Fish. They, they love that we do this, they're impressed with the fact that we do this, and they're one of our major funders. So it really is very, very helpful that all of you help with this survey effort, and I really appreciate all of you taking the time to do it. So um, I don't feel like I get a chance to say that enough, and I, that's why another reason I wanna put this video up online is so, those of you who are here with us live, as well as anyone watching this video who helped with the 2020 Elegant Trogan Survey or any of our, our bird surveys, I really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to help with these surveys. All right. So does anyone have any thoughts before I switch over to the, the 2020 results? Sounds good. Okay. Maybe you'll have some thoughts after seeing the 2020 results. All right. So I'm going to switch it over to a, a screen view. And... You should be seeing spreadsheets. Do you guys see spreadsheets? Yes. We're nodding. Okay. <laughs> spreadsheets. This is this is where it's at. So, um, for the last several years, I've been really trying to organize and collate results and make them so that everybody can see them on these Google My Maps. So, if you go to the Arizona Important Bird Areas webpage, not that. If you go to the Arizona Important Bird Areas webpage and go to resources and then go down to trogans and this is meant as to be resources for you guys for volunteers for surveyors so it's not right on the the front page although this thing i'm going to show i will broadcast this widely if you go to the this trogan page meant this is where all your data forms were and all the information for volunteers at the end here i have sort of cataloged under this home page um, 2017 a page, 2018, 2019 results pages. I will do this again for 2020. I'm working on it now. So soon this will be live and you guys will get the link before anyone else. But I'm going to show you what's going to go on this page, basically, um, all the data. So I've been making um, efforts to map, I'll make it big, to map um, the actual data. Now in the past, um, many people would give us UTMs, but not everybody. So then it was a mixture of sort of putting the little bird face icons where people gave me coordinates for trogans or gave me directions that were specific enough, like at the junction of this trail and that trail, which you could get coordinates for very confidently. So any situation like that, I used to always map them in the past. 
and then sort of just have a summary number for every route where people didn't give me coordinates. But this year we made a special effort and you guys were great. Everyone came through to get us um, actual specific information. It made, a little, it made it a little more complicated to collate the data, which is why it's taking me a little bit longer and doing it remotely is taking me longer. But, um, but it was, the result is great. So we were able to put this uh, draft total map together that I have sent out to you guys which is why it is now up to 231 views. It's awesome. Uh, send that out to you guys. Now, I also have on here for every for each of the five ranges we're gonna look at the routes as well. So these are, I added two new routes this year for the Atascosas. This was the first mountain range that we did. And if you notice a problem with a route you did, like, uh, hey, the, your, your squiggly red line showing the route is way too far east or doesn't go far enough north or whatever, please do let me know because I am actively trying to fix some of these routes for, um, for future years, you know, for future use. So um, if you've noticed a problem with your route, please do let me know. Uh, and I've, I've had already a lot of great input from people that I am using to try to fix these routes. So for this year, for the says which is one of my favorite ranges to do. It's our most Southern uh, area that we survey because it is right on the US-Mexico border. This is an area, a lovely area just west of Nogales. And if you haven't been down there, I highly suggest it's a really cool spot. And it's not a very big range, but it's really a very lovely border canyon area. So we did uh, our normal routes. We did sort of the areas near Peña Blanca Lake right here which is a good landmark for most people. So Peña Blanca Canyon, Walker Canyon, Alamo Canyon, uh, Calabasas Canyon, which has been done um, very well the last several years by someone who knows the area well. Sycamore Canyon, as well as California Gulch, where we didn't find any trogans, <laughs> and a few other areas. Now we added two new routes. These are uh, sort of less canyony areas that as uh, Bellatosa and Pesquiera Canyons, which are very birdy. And I knew about them from some cuckoo surveys we did a few years back. So I had um, them checked this year. They didn't find any trogans, but they did get really good bird lists. So that's certainly, and it's, this is all Coronado National Forest land for the most part. So this is very accessible to the public and really very nice. So we had good numbers in the Atascosas. Then uh, we'll go over the spreadsheets of numbers in a moment. But then the next mountain range that we survey is the Patagonia Mountains right here. And they are a lovely range. And we had a lot of trogans in here too. So I think this is sort of our number two uh, most, uh, let's see. Yeah, we had a, a really high year, uh, which was good. We're kind of in line with most years, but it was really very good. And again, we can't reach all of our routes in the Patagonias anymore. If you're familiar with this area at all, you know there's a lot more active mining happening along Harshaw Road than there used to be. And there's active mining happening sort of on um, the, the Humboldt Canyon area, which has blocked a significant amount of road access, which has made Humboldt Canyon impossible to reach, nearly impossible to reach. So we missed out on some data there. I did see someone manage to get up there in eBird, so we may end up folding that data in, but just showing purely data from our survey right now, uh, we had a lot of good trogans, a lot of males and a lot of pairs. So that's really quite a good mountain range, which surprises a lot of people. If you're not familiar with the Patagonia Mountains, um, it's usually pretty cl relatively close in numbers to what we get for the entire Santa Rita's, which is our next IBA, our next mountain range that we surveyed. So this is the, the, the second to last weekend now of May that we surveyed. And here's the Santa Rita's. And Santa Rita's were great this year. We had a lot of excellent coverage. So areas that sometimes I have trouble getting covered, we did get covered. So our, our, our numbers are very robust. And I think that's part of it. We had full coverage of Madera Canyon, which is awesome. Uh, we both got both Gabe, Cave and Gardner Canyon covered. Temporal Gulch, which is getting, from what I was told, the road is getting more and more challenging every year. So we may not be able to do that one in the future. And then uh, Josephine Canyon, which is done via a very long hike by Sue Carnahan. Thank you, Sue. Really great to get all that great data. A lot of, lots of pairs, four pairs and, a, and an unknown up there in uh, Josephine Canyon. So really great 
coverage and good numbers for the Santa Rita's, which is good. I mean, it's probably, I would say it's the most famous range now for trogans with the you know, Madera Canyon trogans. So then the last weekend of May, we did uh, two mountain ranges again. We did the Huachucas. Now the Huachucas are always a very good range for us, for trogans. It's usually one of the, it's usually the highest number and it looks like it's gonna be again this year. And it was a lot of really great <laughs> trogans. I like looking at these maps because it's kind of cool to see that areas I've been on the east side um, in the Huachucas, like up into like Upper Garden Canyon or places like that, where I didn't realize how close I was to some of these famous canyons on the west side. Sometimes you're just over the ridge, so it's really pretty cool to, to, to look at these, these maps. But we had lots of trogans in Ramsey Canyon and Huachuca Canyon, which is always such a good spot for trogans. I had more coverage of the west side than I've ever had in the past, and it really paid off. Um, pretty much, I don't think, I think only a few people had zero trogans in the Huachucas, and they were areas that are kind of iffy anyway, like I had someone do Miller Canyon, because you never know. There's always trogan sightings early on in the spring in Miller Canyon. Uh, it seems like they use that canyon as a staging area, but they don't seem to really nest there. It's strange. They're usually not there by late May, but they're there early in May. So it's always worth checking, uh, but they did not find any trogans on survey day in Miller Canyon. But nearly, I think, every other spot had them. And another area that I was very glad to get really good coverage of, um, of Sunnyside and Scotia, which is just really good spot for trogans. They really like this West Canyon of the Huachucas, but some uh, Parker Canyon Lake coverage. So this is an, this is the Park Canyon Lake is within what most people call the Canelo Hills, which is sort of a foothills to the Huachucas that has a lot of trogans. We did, um, just not about, we did cuckoo surveys in the Canelos in July and August of 2015 and had really a lot of trogans in there while we were doing cuckoo surveys. It was very surprising. So then it was surprising to us and there was hardly any records in eBird for all of the Canelos. And then when we, um, so for the next year when I was coordinating the Trogan survey, I had people check it. And so we've been doing that since and getting Trogans in this area. And I consider it part of the Huachucas survey because it really is very much a foothills of the Huachucas. So mm -hmm. way out here at Parker Canyon Lake, you get Trogans using, and it is nice. It's a, it's canyony. It's, it's nice, lush habitat. It looks good for Trogans. And there they are. So we had excellent coverage of the Huachucas. I think the best we've ever had of the Huachucas. And then, um, Speaking of best coverage ever, we, for the very last survey of the season, the famous Chiricahuas. And I'm sorry, go ahead. Someone have a question? No? Okay. So for the Chiricahuas, we did very well. Um, we had people, we had, you know, all of Cave Creek complex covered basically, all of South Fork, um, sort of the main drainage of Cave Creek Canyon, um, North Fork, and then Herb Martyr covered really very well. Um, still no trogans in North Fork. We haven't had them there since the big fire, since the big Horseshoe 2 fire, but we keep checking because they used to be in there before the fire. So it's only theoretically a matter of time before they come back. It's worth, it's very important to keep checking and not just have data gaps. Still haven't found them yet though. <laughs> They've been in Herb Martyr. Um, we had trogans detected on herb martyr um, drainage for the survey day. And interestingly, it turns out now that I'm sure most birders are aware that there has since been um, first just one young male eared quetzal in the herb martyr area. And now it looks like a, a second bird, a female, has shown up at, in this area in the Chiricahuas. And looking back, people thinking back to when they first started hearing that strange sound in the herb martyr area, it looks like that bird may have been around on survey day. It's just nobody had quite figured out what was going on. And then it was um, reported several days after survey day. So that's pretty cool. The bird there may have been a second species of trogan around that day, but it wasn't confirmed then. And it wasn't certainly included in the official data. But that's interesting to think about that there may have been, that Quetzal may have been lurking around um, during the, the Trogan survey, which is pretty neat. We had good Trogan numbers on South Fork. This seems to be coming back. Uh, the numbers have were totally declined um, since the 2011 Horseshoe 2 fire, but they do seem to be, be coming back a bit. And interestingly, we have had people check 
drainage is on the west side of the Chiricahuas the last several years. Um, and they don't really ever turn up anything. <laughs> but this year we had more coverage than usual. I had enough people to send people into additional canyons on the west side. So Rucker is a, a well-known burning canyon on the west side that we have surveyed at least four or five years in a row. We, we do have someone who does that every year. And this year they did have trogans in there, which is really great. And it helped that a hiking club that had birders in the club a few days before the survey heard a trogan in there. So we knew to sort of where to focus our checking and make sure we hit certain areas. And they did find trogans. We also sent people into um, Turkey Creek because people, so many people going to see the Chesant, the crescent chested warbler had reported trogans and so we did send some two teams into the area to search and they did not find a trogan on trogan survey day but it's interesting that people had reported them on ebert so i'm really glad we checked we didn't find trogans on the survey though but the chiricahuas are definitely seem to be rising in number which is really very cool uh considering they've been so low for so long all right so the other thing i wanted to show you guys is the data so oh that's different okay so this data this is the data okay so this is my spreadsheet my excel spreadsheet of um the data i've been working on uh that everyone's been sending and i have lots of lots of little tabs here so i have um sort of everyone's raw data here and it's a lot we had 124 different reported sightings which is cool and then i broke it out by range and it all gets very complicated with coordinates and utms but the summary here this is the main thing that i wanted to show you guys so this is my draft summary of each of the mountain ranges so far so the atascosas look pretty good at um you know a pair 13 males two females and two unknown just unknown gender uh, for a total of 19, and that's pretty on par. It, it, the Atascosas fluctuate from about 12 to 20 birds, to maybe a little more than 20 sometimes. And a lot of it has to do with timing. It's the first one we do, so sometimes the numbers are low because it seems like the trogans just haven't gotten back yet, and then all the eBird reports come in after <laughs> survey day. But that's that's a that's a good count. Uh, Patagonias were up to 26 birds. That's, uh, that's, that's good, but probably that's a good, good amount. 10 meters are doing good this year. 49 is what we're, my draft total. That's a lot, that's good. That's a little higher than normal, I would say. Uh, Wachukas, I'm still missing a little bit of data from my spreadsheet in here for the Wachukas, but looking strong at, at 10 pairs so far documented in the Wachukas, that's good, up to 34 birds. And Chiricahua's looking real good here at, uh, See, nine pairs up to 30 birds. That's the highest we've had in a long time for the Chiricahuas. Now, some of these may fall off uh, once we decide if some of them are double counts or not. Actually, but this let's is compare. Now, this is a spreadsheet I have never really released to the public. This is what Troy and I have been working on. And I don't know if I'll ever actually put it online. Uh, but this is the our summary data, our totals that Troy and I spent a lot of time going through old data forms and stuff since we weren't being as careful in um, past years as we've been, especially when I first started doing this and didn't quite have everything completely <laughs> down yet. Um, we went through and have a lot of these other tabs go into a lot of more specific information of exactly how many routes and stuff we did so we could determine if effort was a factor in numbers rising or falling. But um, you can see here that the general trend has been upward. So the 2013 data, the total was at 97 birds, and then 2014 up to 107. Uh, so fluctuating around 100 then for two years, 2015, 101. 2016, 134. And this is when, I would say it's about 2016, where I had it much more at the level that it's at now in terms of coordinating it, the amount of routes we were doing, getting things, more understanding exactly where to send people and how to, how to do this, uh, correctly i would say to do the survey correctly sort of starting in 2016. so then then i feel like these are numbers that are pretty comparable from then on so 134 in 2016 160 in 2017 183 in 2018 it was high 2018 was a good year for trogans and then um 2018. i'm still missing a little bit of data for 2020 but the total so far is 158. so 
it's looking good. I think it's going to be on par with 2019, the number we're going to get. And I think we'll end up being actually a little higher, somewhere between 2019 and 2018. So 2018 being our absolute highest ever, it'll be kind of near there, I think, for, for 2020. We did well. We had really good coverage. And all the mountain ranges uh, did really well with delivering, um, you know, obviously having a lot of trogans around this year. And it looks like it's going to be hopefully a good monsoon. Looking outside, I see lots of big clouds. So right now, that's sort of July and monsoony time. This is usually when parent, you know, parents of you know, trogan parents are usually feeding their young, and they feed them. They grow quite fast. Then once they're hatched, they grow very rapidly and will fledge pretty pretty quickly, but still need to be fed for quite a long time and grow outside of the nest. So they need a lot of insect protein to make that happen and they need abundant insects so they can practice catching them themselves. So about now is when a lot of them start fledging. So if you go out into some of these canyons, you know, into the next two months during the monsoon, you might well see families of trogans together uh, as they teach the baby how to hunt and stuff. It's really quite, quite fun. That's one of the things I really enjoyed about cuckoo surveys was seeing lots of trogans in the mountain ranges around here. So before we move on from from the data, which to me is just such a delightful part of all of this, actually, I actually really do do enjoy spreadsheets and data. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about this year's or any, any of the data? Yeah, yes. I have a question. So mm -hmm. I think you showed the uh, the data for Walker Canyon South, which is the only one I participated on. Yes, and. Uh, it quickly looked to me that you only had uh, one uh, trogon recorded for the Right, you guys had a pair and a trog and a male, right? Yeah, we had a pair and a male. Okay, so Tim was of the opinion that the pair you guys saw was the same pair that the other team had recorded as well. Oh. Because okay. it was kind of right on the boundary. And Tim yeah. confirmed with me that it was, um, he actually suggested before he even asked that it was almost certainly going to be a pair that was detected by both teams. So I put that pair on the sort of more northern route and put your guys' mail that no one else saw on the southern route. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is always some of that. You, there's always some interpretation. That's why mapping the data is super helpful because sometimes people will report trogans and I can see that is seen by different people. Once you map it out, it becomes very obvious that they were probably the same bird, or at least you know some of them may have been the same birds that people detected. I'm getting better. I, I hope at avoiding that by sort of seeing that in past years and, and altering routes so that it prevents overlap. But there's still, especially when we split up canyons like Wachuca Canyon and the Wachucas, it's just too long. It's too the habitat's too good for too long to have one team do it well. So we do an upper and a, and a lower. And right on those boundaries, you got to be really careful <laughs> about double counting uh, and mapping. It really helps. So yeah, that's what's going on with that, Jim. Anyone have any other questions about the data? All right. So now it's um, fun. Oh, so, I guess so, yes, Linda. Yeah. So I wasn't didn't have a question, but I just want to say that the effort um, is extraordinary that you've put into this, and others. You know, I, I don't know who's helping you, but it's pretty impressive. You know, I mean, I've been do I haven't been you know I've been doing it. For a number of years, and um, I mean, it just you know, just the orientation, find, finding, you know, figuring. I mean, of course, we have better tools now with all the GPS, but it's really helpful, and um, it's it's really interesting to see the data. Really, oh, interesting. so thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's so nice. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Super that. job. You. Super job. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you. Now, another thing I'm, I've been kicking around is uh, there's been some interesting sightings that have come in of trogans not associated with the survey. But um, but people had great observations, one of which uh, Linda Hanna had in the Rincon. She detected a trogan, which she sent me lots of great information about. And uh, Brian Nicholas detected it again as well. I think maybe the same bird, I'm not sure. But also had a trogan in the Rincons. Uh, Brian had a trogan the day before the Santa Rita survey in uh, Florida Canyon, which wasn't in the data. So there's a few of these other sightings, the very reliable sightings that were done by people that I think we're going to add to the map, but with a different sort of icon that makes it clear that it's, they're not official data, but that adds to the whole picture of Trogan. So, or, you know, Trogan distribution in Southeast Arizona, which will help guide choices we make in the future on where to send people. So, 
So that's, yeah. that's pretty great. A lot of good sightings coming in from people. So it's a really is such a huge effort, but thank you. thank you for your kind words, Linda. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it was interesting to see that there's been Trogon sighted in the uh, Galliuros. And so yeah. I was just curious, I mean, have there ever been any sightings in the Pinolinos or, you know, other, you know, the north uh, mountain ranges? That's a good question. So I have never heard of a sighting, and I have sort of poked around. I've never heard of a sighting in the Pinolinos. Now, the Galleros is one that has been on our radar for a while. And I have a note here on this summary data of, of all the years that Tucson Audubon's done it since 2013. Um, so for 2016, we did add a Galleros survey, and we had a few birds. We had four total trogons that were found on that survey, and people do sometimes report them there when they're backpacking, and occasionally there's like winter reports from the Galleros too, which is pretty interesting of trogons, but the logistics were very difficult. The only way to get in there was through backpacking, so yes, for the last several years since, we haven't really done it as part of the official survey, Dude. but I know we miss a few every year in the Galleros, I'm sure, uh, up to four. Yeah, up to four birds. Now, the Rincons was one that was on my radar. I was fully expecting a, you know, verified sighting from the Rincons any year now, and, and Hannah getting that recording verifies it, and then Brian also got a recording of the bird calling. So, I was expecting that, because people who do all bird surveys, for the Saguaro National Park, since much of the Rincon Mountains is part of Saguaro National Park, uh, someone who was doing all bird surveys up there told me they thought they heard one, but they didn't get a recording or anything, so it wasn't really something you could, you know, put your hat on, but it was definitely a very intriguing report from someone who really knew what they were doing. So I was very interested in seeing when the, the, the Rincons were gonna pop into the mix, and, and they have now. So now that there's been official sightings in the Rincons, we'll have to think about maybe trying to recruit some really strong hikers. <laughs> Since it is a wilderness area, you can't drive in there at all, and there's no roads anyway. It, that would be, like the Galleros, a big commitment a hiking survey. The Rincons we have, yeah, yeah. not the Galleros. Galleros is, it's, yeah, the areas where the Trogans are, um, so Rattlesnake, Rattlesnake Canyon is where the only place we had a pair that one year, and it was it was an overnight backpacking expedition to get in there. Now Aravica, Arav, Aravipa Creek is sometimes where they're reported as well, and that is easier to access. You're right, you're right, Dick. But uh, the parts that have the best habitat are very difficult <laughs> to get to logistically. You can do it absolutely. There's good maps and everything, but it's it's uh, definitely takes people who are very strong, committed hikers to get in there. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to do, and I appreciate so many people participating in this, was to look at some of the photos people shared. This was such a great feature. I had, I had hardly ever used Google Images before, but since we're using all the Google products at Tucson Audubon, I tried it and it works really well. People were able to collaborate and share photos really, really nicely. So let's see here. I feel like if I click on them, it's hard to see the, the names afterwards, which is kind of a weird feature. But here's Lori's photo of a, of a little trogan. Can you guys see the trogan okay? See the photo? Okay. So this is, yeah, they're pretty photos. So that's Lori Conrad's photo from the Chiricahuas of uh, a, a lovely male trogan popping out of his, his nesting hole. There's a Julia Rose. <laughs> Julia took this photo. So this is going to be Sycamore Canyon in the Atascosas. Well, just it was so nice to see everyone's like, lovely flowers and you know cowboy fried egg flower and this is the sort of thing I do too when I'm out in the field is taking just tons hey, of photos of flowers uh, and scenery. Hey Jenny. Yeah. The the arrow that's about midway down on the uh -huh. screen. Just click that to go from one to one. Okay, it's strange though because then I can't see people's names when I do that. I don't know why it's doing oh, you that. Can't? Yeah, at least I over on over on the left hand side, I see the put put your there. See that arrow? Yeah. Hit that. It just goes to the back photo. Okay, we just go through oh, this oh, way. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's funny because it went. Oh, oh, okay. I see what the problem is. Yeah, and it's it's, the, it's not a problem, but you know yeah. we can sort of go through them. But this is a lovely. It's one of those native thistles. Just love people's photos. It's so nice. Oh, wildflowers. Oh, Julia, Julia and her flowers. 
uh, some the fact that yeah it makes it clear you're in a in a border canyon right there some some water just hanging out lovely uh <clears throat> pine columbine flowers it is such a lovely time of year to be out in the canyons that's another thing i really love about this job is it gets me out there looking at these areas oh that's um that's a uh, cubby let's see that's cubby right it's jane lash yeah that's cubby in the patagonias it's like a what is that let's see how do we zoom in what is it a, a horror no it is there it is zoom in mm -hmm. It's a cow. cow. <laughs> it's a cow. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's a cow. So you're on the Coronado. All right. Oh, this is one that really intrigued me. Whose photo is this? Anyone have a guess on this feather? Oh, Sue Carnahan. I have to contact Sue. Whoa. What do you think about oh. this feather. I'm wondering if it's a Drogon feather. I think it might be. Yeah. I have to get Sue's opinion. I didn't know they had that, that blue at the end like that. And it might be something else, but it looks sure looked to me like a, a trogon feather. Yeah. Oh, and then the lovely uh, you know, claret cup cacti you see in the Sky Island Canyon. It's a really cool spider. Let's see, whose photo is this? This looks like to me like Santa Rita's, but it's uh Sue, yeah. So that's gonna be uh, Josephine Canyon in the Santa Rita's. You can do that. I could have taken some more. <laughs> and then uh a really cool bug. Yeah, this is the first year we've collected photos from participants in this way. I think I'm going to continue into the future. It's so great. I love it. It's just, so people take such lovely pictures. A beautiful um, butterfly. Does anybody know what type of butterfly? Hey, Richard, you have? It's a gray hair streak. Hair streak? Yeah, gray hair streak. Gray hair streak? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you're missing your chance. What butterfly is it, Richard? Yeah, right there, sure. Gray hair streak. This confirms right there. Okay, so then lovely another view of the San Marinos. This is, I think this is Troy's picture, right? Yeah. This is, uh, yeah. So this is Troy Corman from Game of Fish's photo. And he camped in Sunnyside Canyon you know, to do Sunnyside Scotia Canyons. So this is obviously their little camping setup. So that was kind of fun. I also camped in the Wachucas to do our survey, which is really fun. Not that far from where they were. Uh, someone's beautiful sunrise photo. Wow, that's Melissa. Okay, so this, yeah, beautiful photo. Oh, the grasslands. Not a trogan. Trogan in a pine tree. Oh, this is Troy's photo. So this would have been either Sunnyside or Scotia. And this is the thing I, that really blew my mind when I first, first started doing these trogan surveys is they're not just in sycamores. We find them in oaks in the Patagonias. And if you go into high enough in places like the Huachucas, like Sawmill Canyon, they're using pine trees. There's a bear running away. Oh, whose photo is that? Bear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bear. Karen LeMay. So this would have been in Wachuca Canyon. That's the, the canyon she did. Olia uh, also had quite the bear sighting during her Trogan survey in, uh, on Upper Cary Nation Trail. She had um, a, a bear <laughs> that she scared, that scared herself. And then the bear, too, luckily, you know, was very scared. And he ran off. But boy. I had several people report to me they saw bears on this survey. It's another lovely Trogan survey. It's a sort of from the bottom, oh, another Troy photo, looking straight up at a, at a fluffy red male Trogan. Lovely uh, Columbine photo. There's a distant Trogan. I loved this photo. Who, whose was this? It's so artistic. Oh, Melissa. Okay, this is so artistic. Uh, it's black and white, first of all, which is really cool. And then there's this Trogan way in the distance. And I feel like this is actually a pretty good uh, representation of how you often see trogans, just sort of way in the distance, sort of silhouetted. Really cool photo. Another bear. <laughs> Another black bear photo. Lovely little little pink flower. Look pretty. Uh, Someone got a praying mantis. A rainbow hedgehog. Right? Lovely rainbow hedgehog about to flower. Looks like. Uh, butterfly. Is it a is it a buckeye? What is it? That's a uh, red satyr. Red satyr. Very good. Wow, you know your butterflies. And then this is someone, let's see, what canyon is this? This is almost like a beautiful, beautiful, lush, wet canyon. Really nice. But I love this one, too. Look at this grasshopper. You're blending in perfectly with these leaves. Really pretty. Some lovely, um, this looks like that 
uh, Arizona milkweed. Yeah, that, that, that butter, the one we were just selling this at our plant sale with the really pretty orange flowers, really nice. Yeah, they are. The butterflies are crazy about those. They love it. Yeah, I got to get some of that. And then this really cool snake. Okay. The rattler. And the rock rattler, says Richard. Uh, whose photo is this? We're getting towards the end here. Oh, Troy again. Wow, Troy had that. Wow. I love this too. This was the the um, lower Wachuca's team going in to do their survey, being totally masked up in the car. Nicely done, guys. Yes, Karen, Karen LeMay and Bob Bersark and John. Um, and another lovely trogan. He's got a big fuzzy, big fuzzy wuzzy caterpillar. This is Lori's photo. Okay, so this is from South Fork of the Chiricahua Zen. Uh, lovely fuzzy wuzzy caterpillar. Beautiful. Drainage just looks like more South Fork. No, that's my photo. Yeah, I took that photo. That is South Fork of the Chiricahuas. And then this really cool raven on a power pole. I think that's at the end. Yeah, I think it starts repeating. There we go. Here's the last one. So really cool photos, guys. Everyone did such a nice, I really appreciate everyone, um, you know, participating and sending in photos. If you still want to put in some photos, that's great. Cause well, I'll, I'll do a whole thing, um, montage on the, at the end of the report, you know, sort of that, that page report I do for the, for public consumption of this is what we found in Southern Arizona for Trogans. So I really appreciate you guys doing that. It's really very cool. Uh, I think I'm going to get rid of screen sharing now. How about I do that? Stop share. Okay. So does anyone else have, um, does anyone want to say anything or, or have any thoughts or anything they want to share? Thanks for the report. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy, happy to share all this information with you guys. I really, I'm trying to get really on top of sharing as much as possible with you guys because I know you guys know more than anyone else what's going on um, in your canyon, but it's such a fun thing to see what's happening in the whole, the whole survey area. Any, anyone want to say anything? Yeah, the, the trogans in Sawmill Canyon, you're right. Uh, that first half mile is a lot of conifers, yeah. uh, uh, chihuahua pines and, and uh, Apache pines along with the ponderosas. There are some sycamores in there, but uh, uh, it is interesting to have uh, uh, trogans all the way up to the crest sometimes. Yeah. Uh, past uh, Sawmill Spring, and that's really all conifers up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so cool to see them just using, you know, like flicker holes or, you know, cavities created by woodpeckers up in those pines, which is similar strategy to what they use in the Patagonias, because it's similar to the Patagonias, but, but similar but different, where there are sycamores, there are areas with sycamores, but then you have whole areas where there's no sycamores for miles around, but large oaks and pines, and they'll, they'll nest in those areas using woodpecker holes. It's at a lower elevation, but it's kind of a similar situation. It's very cool. Trogans are very dynamic, very fascinating birds. It's really fun doing a big survey effort and, with them. And the territory oh. seem to, in Sawmill Canyon, territories seem to be about a half mile apart. Yeah, yeah so it's clearly a good area. They're, they're packing in there relatively tight. Yeah. Anyone else have any final thoughts? Yeah. Uh, never, is that you, Pam? Yeah, that's me. I got to kill this phone call coming in. <laughs> Throwing it some other. Yeah. I get so constant telemarketing calls these days. Oh, my. Hang on. No, it's okay. I do want to share one, one thought myself, too, which is I wore my Trogan shirt. And you, I couldn't even, like, I, I realized I had the camera to wow. uh, show it. This is my new Trogan shirt I got. I wore it today for this uh, for this this party. Got that the Tucson Audubon Nature Shop whole promo. But yeah, so I like to wear my my Trogan shirts when I do Trogan things. All right. Hey, I I took care of my phone call. Um, the the day after the survey, Ted and I hiked up South Fork Cave Creek, and I think I sent you an email about this. And then about the 1.2 miles point up there, uh, where there's the pond, and then. The, um, that little waterfall, yes. That, that little pool. Um, we we watched a, a trogan go. Uh, first, he was uh, fly catching in the creek, so we saw him, uh, you know, perched on a, on a rock and then going after different insects. And then he flew upstream, and when we rounded the the trail around the knoll there, we watched him belly flopping almost in this small pool. He was 
skimming across the top of the pool, getting all his breast and belly feathers wet, and then he'd go onto a rock and groom. And he did oh. this five or six different times. And I don't know if this is unusual behavior or not. We were just so thrilled to that's see it. Wow, that's really cool. I've never seen a frozen having a bath. Oh. I'm sure they do it, you know, probably every day, but I've never really seen that. How neat. Wow. Yeah, I had sent you an email on this. Yes, yeah, and it was, it's just such fascinating behavior. And just getting so many people out there um, watching these birds, we get such amazing sightings from everybody. Oh, that's really great. Thank you, Pam, for, for conveying that story. I really appreciate that. Anyone else have any final thoughts they want to share? Well, just how much fun it is doing the surface surfing. Oh, I got to say, every time, every time I do it, I, I actually observe different trogon behavior it seems you know i get a new glimpse at them and and so, okay i'm going to share this crazy story years ago it must have been like almost 20 years ago and kathy jacobs who's on the board can vouch for me i'm not making this up but it was on the road the south fork road right off the road there were a pair of trogons males who were flying at each other tussling in the ground uh, tussling it tussling in the air and then they would fall to the ground and they would just lay there. Has anybody ever seen that? And then they get up and they do it all over again. Wow. No, I've never seen a, an altercation get so violent. They're like literally still fighting on the ground. Like it's not like hummingbirds, like hummingbirds would do, you know? That's, yeah. That's pretty cool. It was pretty bizarre. I've never, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Troy. I see you. I see your, your name now. Yeah, sorry, I was a little late. No, no, that's okay, Troy. We were just uh, so. Um, I am going to post this for anyone who's who's uh, who pops in. I am going to post this video on sort of the volunteer page and send the link out to everyone to to to. I did record this this party slash summary of the data. Um, so yeah, and absolutely, you'll be able to watch it again later. But uh, do you have anything? Do you have anything you want to share? We're just sort of at the story stage now. No, just, it's just nice for me being up in Phoenix to have an excuse to come down to Southeast Arizona. And, and um, since this year, especially uh, since a lot of my, my projects and my surveys were canceled this year. So this is one of the few that didn't get canceled. So it was good to be, have that opportunity to go down and, and, and visit those canyons that I only get to visit once a year. Great to have your help, Troy. I really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing. We, when we looked at all the, the photos that were shared in that Google folder, that Google album, thanks for sharing your cool photos of, of Trogans and your campsite. That was really neat. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. You could, you could if you go back to that campsite, you'll see um, Tom Lewis was with me. We drove separately um, because of the COVID thing this time. And uh, his, his tent is up in the air off to the right. Yeah, it's like, those it's like a hammock, the, kind of. Yeah. Between the trees. Really cool. Yeah, that was really neat. Yeah. It's really cool. Oh, well, thank you all so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. Um, and I am going to get this video online. So if anyone wants to, if you want to share it with anybody or, or watch it again or anything, you certainly can. But uh, I just want to have one final, final parting thought of just thanking you all again so much, everyone who helped with these surveys. We really could not do this huge, you know, important bird areas effort of monitoring pretty much what's mo pretty much all of the breeding population of Southeast Arizona, or at least nearly all of it. Um, and I just, I really appreciate you guys' help. Over 70 people helped with this survey. It's a huge, huge group effort. And uh, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for doing it. Yeah. Absolutely, it's fun. I actually, I really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot happening all in the same month, but it's, I love it, it's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks, thanks for you and Rick for pulling all this together because yeah. uh, the species w wouldn't get wouldn't get monitored any other way well enough to to know what our populations are. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun and it's it's certainly a huge a huge group effort and a lot of hours from everybody go into it. So I really appreciate you all for doing that so much. Great, so thank you so much. Right. Um, just an update uh, on the, the pair that Ted and I watched for three hours at the Santa Rita Lodge when they were the male was checking out and trying to entice the female to nest in the utility pole right there by the casino. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we went, we were there this past Tuesday, just a few days ago, and uh, got an update from uh, one of the uh, people at the lodge. 
And they said, well, initially they started to nest in that hole, but then stopped. And apparently they haven't nested anywhere. They've been looking around at different holes and the male was there. The male was there on Tuesday. He was, you know, barking and uh, we didn't see the female, but uh, according to the lodge people, they've never found a suitable site. Wow. So something went wrong for them, maybe. Wow. How interesting. I like it. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it seemed like the Madera Canyon was an interesting one this year because it did seem like we had trogans lower than normal, lower down the canyon than normal. And I was seeing eBird reports before we ever did the survey that they were lower than normal. So I, we added a route, which is the one I think you did, uh, Dick. I think maybe you were part of that route. I can't quite remember. But we we did a lower route than normal and had trogans on it. And one theory I've heard since on to why this could be, and I had this in other areas too, trogans showing up in areas where usually like a little lower, sort of downslope the canyon than normal. And one theory I heard was that because of the pandemic, maybe there was just fewer people going into some of these areas which made Whoa. them more confident to use some of these sites. And then things kind of opened up a bit more and they got crowded again with people. Because on survey day in Madera Canyon, if anyone else was in Madera Canyon this year uh, for the survey, it got very crowded <laughs> with oh, humans yeah, by the end of the, you know, once we were all leaving by that time. So I don't know, it was interesting because it did seem like Trogans were using areas that they don't usually, I mean, they don't usually, nest sort of below the lodge but people were reporting them all the way down to you know madera picnic ground which is much lower than normal uh in, in most years but yeah it's been it's such an interesting year and the fact we have such good coverage this year i think is going to make it this data even more interesting to look at but uh but thank you all so much and i did see one chat come in oh gene it's nice to have you gene thank you for coming now uh no problem gene and then um I am going to, just so you know, Jane, I'm going to post this so you can watch the whole thing from the beginning if you'd like. Uh, Jenny, yeah. I got one question. Is there any data that they might be nesting site limited? Oh, like, is there a, a, a like, um, are they at capacity for, for nesting? Well, like, not, not capacity, but they can't find enough proper nesting holes. There's habitat, but they can't find the holes. You know, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, and if, if anyone has any thoughts, uh, please jump in. But I don't, I don't, I wouldn't think that would be the case. I don't know of any research on that specifically. Now, cavities are always in high demand. I mean, birds yeah. and animals will, because not just the birds using them, the ringtails versus the sulfur belly flycatchers versus, you know, the woodpeckers themselves, they're always sort of battling over the best cavities. Um, so I think maybe very, very high quality cavities are definitely always in demand. But I don't know if it's enough, since sycamores create cavities on their own, plus all the woodpecker holes that are created and the other trees, I don't know if that's going to be a limiting factor for them. I'm not sure. Troy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, just based on even natural cavities in sycamores that, that are available. And, and these are one of the larger cavity nesting species. So, and a lot of birds only choose cavities about the size that they can get in to kind of limit how many predators can get in. So I wouldn't think there'd be um, too much limitation for these larger cavities. I mean, granted, there are some species else that use these larger cavities, but I would think that most of the other cavity nesters are looking for smaller cavities, the bulk of what we've got out there. Yeah, good. very interesting point, Troy. I hadn't thought of that. It's a very good point. Cool. Well, that's a very, very good question. Thank you, Dick. Anyone else? Um, have any thoughts or questions? Yeah, Linda. Jenny, Jenny, I'll just say that, you know, I have been going up to Madeira Canyon pretty regularly since all, all year. And there was a crush of people up there, even when it was during lockdown, because really? people okay. didn't have a lot of places to go. So I think the theory about, you know, there weren't as many people is not it's out the window from Madeira Canyon, not, for sure. But I've, and I heard, you know, in one evening we were up there, I heard them, heard one, a male, I think, um, at White House Camp uh, picnic area, which is you know just north of Proctor, or just up from Proctor Road, so it's pretty far down. Yeah, pretty far down, and that's usually a place we have them in the winter, but not in the breeding season. So that was yeah. very interesting this year, how how that was going on, and I think we'll continue to to monitor that that low that that new route, the lowest route, the now the new one, which is now the lowest. We're going to continue to do that just in case it happens again in future years. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. It'll be it'll be interesting. To, I, I think it'd be interesting to see if there's more pairs in the canyon. So the upper canyon might been have the normal numbers, but more may have moved in, so they're kind of pushed down to lower mm-hmm. elevations. If, if if there might be an extra pair or an extra territory or so. That's a very good thought to try. That that's probably it, actually if I had to guess. Yeah, that's that's a very good very good thought. Oh, great. Well, thank you all so much. And uh, anyone who watched the recording of this, thank you, everyone, for, for helping with this, this survey effort. Uh, great job, everyone. I really appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks again, thank you.